All right, everyone, welcome back. So glad that you made it live with us. And um, for those of you that are live, you get the advantage of asking questions and all the great dialogue at the end and the community feel. for it. So we really do appreciate you making it live with us. But we're going to dive right into it and talk about the optimizing the gut metabolic axis and how to enhance the release of these different hormones that really affect our systemic metabolism. And the, the reason why we're having this webinar tonight is I was very motivated after doing a great podcast with Sean Croxton over there at Underground Wellness last week. If you go into iTunes, just go into Sean Croxton, C R. R-O-X-T-O-N, or just type in Underground Wellness in iTunes, you'll see. And we got excellent feedback from that uh, podcast. And we talked a little bit about gut hormones, but you know, for, the, for you all listening right now, we're going to dive a lot deeper into that. And um, I realized that people just want to learn more about this. So I was really happy and grateful that that was the case. And, and so here we are. So anyway, uh, there's many different ways that we can go with talking about how the gut influences our metabolism from gut hormones to uh, gut bacteria to inflammation to short-chain fatty acids. But today we're going to focus on these gut-derived hormones and how they affect fat storage, fat burning, and systemic insulin responses and also appetite and satiety. And it's really uh, pretty powerful, actually. This is, as you'll soon learn, where all the new diabetic drugs are going, where all the new uh, research surrounding bariatric surgery is looking at, and, and how we can optimize the hormones released from the intestinal cells. And these are called incretin hormones. And this may seem new to you, but trust me, this is a very old topic. And before we talk about where we're going in the future, I want to talk about what is the previously recognized understanding of metabolism. And we know that when we eat carbohydrate containing meals that tends to raise blood sugar and blood sugar likes to be in a narrow window. So what happens is the pancreas releases insulin and insulin is responsible for depositing glucose into different cells, mostly cells of the metabolic system, which would include muscle tissue, liver tissue, and fat tissue. But we know that um, when individuals become dysfunctional, they can actually deposit uh, glucose, for example, and, and uh, in various other tissues, for example, like the red blood cells and retina and nerve tissue and so forth. And that would be obviously pathogenic. So anyway, that's kind of where we've been focused. And from a nutritional functional medicine standpoint, the focus has been on how can we modulate systemic insulin sensitivity, you know, using cr things like chromium, vanadium, alpha-lipoic acid, green tea, and all these various compounds, which yes, they're beneficial. Yes, they're antioxidants, some of them. Yes, some of them are nutrients involved in glucose uptake. But it's, it's not really showing the whole story, the whole new metabolic model. And that new metabolic model is looking at the GI tract. Not only the hormones released from the gut, and there's a couple dozen of these different hormones, but also the bacteria and how that bacteria interact with the intestinal lining and how the bacteria interact with our food and create secondary byproducts, such as short-chain fatty acids. Uh, and it, we don't even, that's not even talking about gut permeability. We know GI permeability is a huge driver of perturbed metabolic changes in the body, i.e. diabetes, insulin resistance, and so forth, because that drives inflammation. Inflammation is another antagonistic factor, which creates insulin resistance. But again, just this is an overview. You have the images right here. Uh, again, this video is going to be on YouTube as well. I'll have the links for that for you at the end. But let's talk about what we can do at the gut level and really dive into it. Well, the hormones or the mediators that we want to go after, they're called incretins. And the big dog, the big one is called GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1. And the good thing about this is there's many natural phytochemical compounds that release or help to help the gut to release more of this compound called GLP-1. We also have herbs that affect the beta cell function. We know beta cell burnout is kind of an end stage uh, characteristic linked with diabetes, but it, it is still there. We know that we can affect systemic insulin sensitivity with different compounds such as cinnamon, fenugreek, chromium, vanadium, and so on. But we're going to focus on the aspect of the incretins, the GLP-1, and some of my favorite are, is berberine. And I'm going to talk about berberine extensively as we make our way through this webinar, but also resveratrol. Resveratrol is very critical for so many different things. It's a great nutrient, a great phytochemical, uh, so many anti-aging properties, so many beneficial metabolic properties, antioxidant, and much more. But it also affects the gut. And so that might be how it's benefiting the whole body, or at least one mechanism of that. So we need to talk and define the incretin effect and I'm sure you've heard this, and if you haven't, I'm going to define it. But is an incretin is a compound derived from the GI tract that affects systemic insulin activity. 
Again, insulin is the key that opens the door for glucose to get into cells. It's so important for insulin to be sensitive, for our receptors to be sensitive. Now, I'm going to read a quote from the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism way back in 1965. Okay, this is about incretins. And so this is a long time ago, before the iPad, before Wi-Fi, before the internet, really. A humoral substance is released from the jejunal wall. That's the portion of the small intestine, the jejunum. During glucose absorption, which acts by stimulating the release of insulin from the pancreatic islet cells. So what does this mean? Well, way back in 1965, researchers suspected that there was something being released from the middle portion of the small intestine that was communicating with the pancreas to better regulate and control the release of insulin after blood sugar rised or, or, you know, was increased during a meal or after the meal. So really, really important that we understand that this is an old paradigm. And if we take a step back and think about it, and I never even really thought about this until I dove into this research and started writing, you know, the book Belly Fat Effect was, you know, how did we think that the pancreas was sensing the elevation in blood sugar? You know, it makes a lot more sense. Obviously, the brain's involved and there's different, you know, the liver's involved and so on. But it makes a lot of sense that glucose is first being touched or, you know, Uh, The first point of which glucose is coming in contact in the body is the intestine. And so it makes a lot more sense that if the intestine is sensing and receiving this glucose or these carbohydrates or any meal for that matter, that it would then communicate to its sister organ, the pancreas. And then the pancreas would release different hormones based upon the composition and the quantity of that meal. And that's exactly what happens. You know, that communication goes on. And if you look at embryology, you know, the, 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 the uh, stem cells in the gut, you know, start to, to, to develop. And then the pancreas and the liver really branch off from that. So when I say sister organ, that's what I'm referring to. So there's some communication uh, going on between these different organs at a much higher level than previously recognized, which is really, really fun. Anyway, there's a bunch of different hormones, not only GLP-1, there's PYY, there's CCK or cholecystokinin, there's GIP, there's many of these different guys, like I said, you know, 20, 24, maybe even more, there's there's new ones being discovered uh, as time goes on. So they're very powerful, and I have this image up here of a YouTube video that I made over two and a half years ago, and not that it's a great video by any means, but... Uh, I like to see where I've come and and where the science was back then. And I highlight one of these recent studies that show that uh, over 28 years ago, researchers first reported reductions in these gut hormones in individuals that have diabetes. So this was an early finding over 28 years ago that the gut becomes dysfunctional at the same time that individuals experience insulin resistance and or diabetes. So With that said, why are we still throwing chromium and alpha lipoic acid? And these we need to also balance those compounds with gut supportive nutrients. And I think, as you'll find as as we go on with this uh, webinar, that that's exactly the combination we want to to mix in or blend in the old with the new. So there's nothing wrong with chromium. There's nothing wrong with green tea or vanadium or these compounds. They're very beneficial. You know, systemic insulin sensitivity is still a problem, but we also want to address the new research, the phytochemicals from uh, different herbs and botanicals that affect the GI tract. So we're getting both of these mechanisms. We're getting, you know, the gut balanced and also the systemic insulin response balanced. Now, additionally, in this video that's on YouTube, again, it's not the greatest video in the whole wide world, but it's the very first video I made, so I'm going to leave it up there just to see my reference point and where I've uh, gone and improved. And so I highlight some studies, and one of them was conducted and reported by the New England Journal of Medicine, which many people would attest is one of the most reputable journals, medical journals uh, in the world. You know, you can have your own opinions on that. But Uh, This study actually tracked overweight individuals after they had embarked on a low-calorie diet, and they measured all kinds of parameters, many metabolic parameters, body weight, waist circumference, you name it. But they also measured the levels of these gut hormones, these gut peptides that we're talking about, such as CCK and peptide YY. 
And guess what? 62 weeks later, that's six two, over a year, you know, a year and 10 weeks, um, what they showed is that the levels of these gut hormones were decreased lower than they were when they started. So uh, it, this goes to show basically that yo-yo dieting, low-calorie diets, bouncing around, going from one diet to the next, causes long-term perturbations in these metabolically critical gut hormones. Again, these gut hormones speak to the pancreas. They're involved in telling the pancreas how much insulin to release. And between 50 and 70%, you know, it depends on which study you read, 50 to 70% of insulin's uh, activity and number, you know, that the amount of insulin that's released is regulated by these gut peptides. That's how important they are. They're so important. And I'll show you, this is where the drug companies are going. Drug companies are not stupid. It's really nice, even though a lot of you listening may not be into drugs and prefer the natural routes and so on, and I totally commend you for that. But it's nice to, I like to look and see, okay, where's the puck going, so to speak? Where are the, are the drug companies developing research and, and learning more about these? And to no one's surprise, they're going after these gut hormones. So one of these compounds is a dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitor. So that's an enzyme, dipeptidyl peptidase, DPP4, is an enzyme that actually breaks down these beneficial gut hormones. It's involved in the recycling of these compounds. Now, Keep in mind that you want higher levels of these compounds. So that would mean that high levels of DPP-4 are going to be bad because the more DPP-4 you have around, that means the more uh, hormones are going to be broken down. You know, it's like a recycling. It's like a garbage truck. So you, you really don't want a lot of garbage trucks around when, um, when you have a beneficial compound, okay? Now, so the drug companies have developed inhibitors of this enzyme. And incidentally... This enzyme is elevated in many disease states, chronic metabolic disorders, autoimmunity, cancers, and much more. Um, it used to be thought that this enzyme was beneficial. A lot of nutrition companies actually sell this enzyme, DPP4, because it so-called uh, degrades gluten. But I would strongly advise that you do not use this enzyme in a supplemental form. Again, it's linked with many different chronic disease states. It breaks down your beneficial gut hormones that affect your appetite, satiety, and inflammatory responses. So you definitely want to avoid this enzyme. And uh, companies that are selling this, you need to look at this research because you could seriously be harming people uh, with that enzyme. So some of these drugs that you, you know, maybe on the lookout for, not that I'm going to recommend that you use them because they are linked with some long-term pancreatic issues, uh, you know, different side effects and so forth. And so the long-term safety may or may not be uh, that good, actually. And that's why I think it's very important to look at natural compounds such as berberine, resveratrol, curcumin, and green tea, and these different things that have been shown to act similarly to the drugs in, the, in terms of their mechanism of action, but don't have that strong effect on uh, the pancreas. And they're not, so to, so to speak, whipping the pancreas and causing challenges. But anyway... Genuvia is one. Bayetta is another. These things are out there. They're effective. I know practitioners that have used them with good response. And also uh, a very commonly prescribed medication called metformin. Although we used to think that metformin affects the mitochondria and affects peripheral blood glucose responses that way, it's now been shown that, mito or that metformin actually increases GLP-1. So go where it all goes back to the gut, right? All roads lead to Rome. Anyway, so here's that slide on DPP4, that enzyme that a lot of companies market and sell as the gluten digestive enzyme. Again, it's linked with many chronic diseases, chronic liver disease, uh, inhibition of cell migration and cancers and uh, autoimmune diseases and so on. So you do not want this um, uh, this enzyme to be high. <laughs> That's the the whole point, right? And that's why drug companies literally have compounds that inhibit this enzyme activity because it's kind of a nasty enzyme. A new wave in the kind of the thinking or the paradigm is to mimic the hormonal effect of bariatric surgery. 
Now, if you're listening to this, you've probably heard me say before, you've probably read my book, Belly Fat Effect, or at least attended another webinar or podcast, but the mechanism of action of bariatric surgery is different than you probably used to think. A lot of people think, and actually a lot of healthcare practitioners that I've met believe that bariatric surgery causes weight loss because it restricts how much food people can eat, but that's not really how it causes weight loss. Maybe a small point of that, a small percentage of that. But bariatric surgery actually is so metabolically protective because it, it leads to a dramatic increase in the, the gut hormones that we've been talking about, these incretin hormones, particularly PYY and GLP-1 and also uh, CCK to a lesser extent. And it also changes the composition of the gut microbiome. So if we could mimic that hormonal effect without having to undergo the procedure, we're going to help a lot more people in a lot less expensive manner and a lot less invasive manner. So that's what we're here to do. And the good news is that we have polyphenols. These are compounds derived from color-rich fruits and vegetables and herbs. We have fiber derived from the similar compounds. And we have probiotics and different proteins that can enhance or mimic that hormonal effect of bariatric surgery without having to undergo the surgery itself, which in my opinion is so powerful and so critical. And that's where we're going. These different incretin hormones are a integrated response involved in the whole digestive response. So if you're not digesting your food, if you're not chewing your food, if you're not in that calm, relaxed, vagal nerve, parasympathetic dominant state, these hormones are not going to be released. These hormones are not only activators of the vagal nerve, but they're byproducts of the vagal nerve. And what that means is that there's a feed forward cycle working on both ends. When you're in that calm, relaxed state, these gut hormones are going to be released maximally. Digestive products are going to be released maximally. And also the release of these hormones actually also stimulate the vagal nerve, which is a huge part of that, that uh, parasympathetic rest and digest response. So very critical that you understand that. So a simple strategy is to increase the levels of these different hormones is to be present when you're eating food, chewing your food, you know, trying to be the last one at the table eating with friends and family, being grateful, envisioning the food being healthy, not only for your body, but for your gut microbiome. And if you miss the podcast with Raphael Kelman, hop on over to iTunes and check that out. High Intensity Health Radio in iTunes, Raphael Kelman and I talk about this at length, the microbiome diet. And it's so fascinating, his perspective. You know, he's a very traditionally trained yeah, medical doctor from Beth Israel Hospital. And he gets into this spiritual component and how when he eats, he envisions the gut microbiome having a feast on his food. And it's just so powerful uh, to hear that. And I think there's, there's so much there. So anyway, we can't forget digestion. And we also can't forget the gut bugs. So these gut hormones um, respond to byproducts of bacterial metabolism. You've probably heard of things called short-chain fatty acids, like butyrate and propionate and acetate. And these compounds, they also stimulate the receptors in the gut that releases different hormones. So it's very critical to have a balanced, healthy gut microbiome and eat foods that are healthy for the gut microbiome. So avoid the white processed foods, eat more color, vegetables, plants, and so on. Now let's dive into the details of this a little bit deeper level. So we know that the GI tract has all the you know, the enterocytes in, in the intestine uh, have these villi-like projections that protrude into the lumen. They're constantly sampling and, and sensing different things. And they not only sense uh, bitter, tastins, berberine, these phytochemicals that we've been discussing, but they, they sense and detect bile acids and various digestive products. And all these things actually uh, have different receptors that they lock onto and then can stimulate the production of various genes which create proteins, such as these gut hormones. So it's very important, again, digestion. I want to highlight this a little bit. Bile is so critical. There's actually a receptor on your small intestine and various actually systemic tissues. I talk about this a lot. And belly fat effect is that bile, there's bile receptors throughout the body. TGR5 receptors, TGR4 receptors are very anti-inflammatory, very powerful. That's So it goes back to digestion and why that is so, so critically important. But again, these, these uh, endocrine slash 
gut cells also sends proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and that affects not only their transport, their translocation into the body so that those macronutrients can be used for energy. Those macronutrients also affect the release of these different hormones from the gut. So it's very critical. Now, the, uh, the so-called endocrine cell of the gut that we want to focus on is called the L cell. This is the, the L cell is the one, the intestinal cell, that seems to be the most metabolically active and releases these beneficial hormones, namely GLP-1, GLP-2, and PYY. And PYY is involved in motility and so forth and satiety. But anyway, the reason why you want to focus on the L cell is because when you take prebiotics in the form of inulin and arabinoglactan, you actually increase the number of L cells that you have in your intestine. And what, why is that important? Because again, the L cells release these different hormones. So that's why it's so critical to have a diet rich in fiber. Uh, because you're going to have, by default, you know, assuming it's good fiber, not just like wheat bran or Cheerios or something, that you're going to have increased levels of these different gut metabolic hormones. All right, so let's dive into the details of this. Now, when you eat a healthy diet, rich in color, rich in fiber, it goes without saying that you also fuel your gut microbiome in a healthy way. So not only are you going to, you know, you kind of kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. I hate to use the word kill, but it makes the most sense where the fibers and the polyphenol compounds increase the number of cells in the GI tract that release these beneficial hormones. They, they increase tight junction function, which is going to improve gut barrier function, reduce leaky gut, which is very beneficial, but also a polyphenolic high fiber diet increases the growth of good healthy bacteria such as bifidobacterium and fecobacterium presnitzii and all these beneficial bacteria. Many studies have shown that probiotics in the form of inulin increase the release of these different hormones. And again, how they do that is increasing the L cells. The L cells are where it's at. That's the bad boy. That's the one that you want to have increased. So I'm highlighting some of these studies. If you're looking at the video right now, there's a bunch of different studies on this, on the on the prebiotics and how they affect this. And, and then also there's different probiotics, particularly bifidobacterium has been shown to increase CCK and PYY and also GLP-1. Again, all these are the beneficial hormones. So you don't need to know all the details. If you want, here's the references by Patrick Canny and Natalie Delzine. All right. Um, eating fiber with meals. Again, it doesn't have to be a prebiotic fiber. This was a resistant starch that has been shown to be beneficial and, and lower inflammation, improve systemic metabolism and, and all that. So, um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the drug companies with the Bayetta and the Genuvia, those are some of the new diabetic drugs that inhibit that bad boy enzyme called DPP4. Well, uh, metformin, which is very commonly prescribed. There's some, a lot of beneficial metabolic properties. I actually think metformin is a good drug. Again, I'm not really a drug guy, so to speak, but I, uh, metformin has some really great mechanism of actions. And this new study that I'm highlighting here in humans shows that, guess what? Metformin also increases the level of these beneficial gut hormones. So again, we're, we're kind of turning our understanding of metabolism on its head, and it goes back to the gut, like I mentioned in the introduction. Now, here's that slide on bile. And again, short-chain fatty acids and bile acids, they have receptors, and they also benefit these different hormones. So Let's talk about uh, let's talk about the phytochemicals. So, cinnamon, curcumin, resveratrol, grape seed extract, soy isoflavones, EGCG. That's epicalogatican gallate. Different polyphenols from carob, green tea polyphenols, berries, chocolate, and cacao, all of which have some sort of effect on the GI tract in some way, shape, or form. Whether that's increasing IGF one, increasing GLP one, increasing PYY affecting leptin and much more. So it's very important that we eat a diet rich in color. Have your dark chocolate, have your berries, have a little bit of red wine here and there, have some curcumin or turmeric root and so on. And I'll show you some very specific studies. Also fats, dietary fats. So there's a lot of data on uh, pine nut oil, which I know it's kind of, you know, pine nuts are, are somewhat expensive, but pumpkin seed, walnuts, you know, any of the, it's the monounsaturated fatty acids have been shown to latch on to these small intestinal cells and really powerfully release these different hormones. So keep your eye out for the, 
uh, include more monosaturated fats in your diet. We know fat is really in right now, but uh, include the nuts and seeds. Let's talk about protein. I've highlighted this before. I talk about this a lot in belly fat effect. Pea protein is so protective, not only for all these different, the amino acid structures and so on, but it's very satiating. And it releases these different gut-derived peptides that are involved in our systemic metabolic physiology. So pea protein is very, very critical. Keep your eye out on that. Uh, this is research from Duke University. And this team has published three or four different studies on this where they've looked at different you know, quantities of pea protein, different routes of administration, whether it's a smoothie or a GI tube or just swallowing it. They figured, and they've compared pea protein to whey protein, egg protein, wheat protein, fish protein, and guess what? Pea protein wins every time. So um, it's not just a vegan hypoallergenic protein. I think pea protein is very protective for overall satiety and appetite and balancing blood sugar. So that's something we need, we should focus on. And I think it's a lot cleaner than the rice protein that's out there. It's more hypoallergenic compared to hemp and chia seed. And, you know, there's a million different types of vegan proteins right now. And you can just find a non-GMO, healthy, clean pea protein. You're going to be doing yourself a favor. So uh, let's talk about some of the herbs. We'll talk about resveratrol first. This is actually emerging from animal models. We don't have data in humans at this time showing resveratrol increases the levels of these gut hormones. But we do have some good preliminary data in animals. So keep that in mind. Now, if you're watching this video, you can see that uh, berberine is a really aromatic molecule. So again, these polyphenols, the phenolic ring is a six-carbon aromatic ring. And as we discussed with uh, Sean Croxton on Underground Wellness Podcast, these polyphenols are fuel for healthy bacteria. You have different phyla of bacteria, firmicutes and bacteroidetes. The firmicutes, or sorry, the bacteroidetes contain enzymes that are able to really metabolize and uh, break down these different polyphenolic compounds, whereas the firmicutes don't. So just by eating a diet rich in polyphenols, you selectively grow good, healthy bacteria. But berberine is no exception. It's a really tough molecule. I bet it's poorly absorbed. But it doesn't matter that it's poorly absorbed because most of its activity and action is in the GI tract. We probably don't need systemic activity of berberine. You know, it's affecting the gut receptors and it's affecting the different gut microflora. So I've highlighted here for you a meta-analysis of all the different clinical studies that have looked at berberine for its metabolic properties. And it's quite astounding. As you can see on this list, they've compared berberine head-to-head. -head, I say they. The researchers have compared berberine head-to-head -head compared to metformin, compared to different compounds. And so it's been shown to reduce fast and blood glucose, hemoglobin A1C, triglycerides, serum insulin, and much more, and even better than some of these medications. So berberine is a really yeah, heavy hitter in terms of a phytochemical herb that you should really be considering. When it comes to weight loss or even insulin sensitization, uh, you know, balancing blood sugar, changing lipids. Remember, you can't burn fat if you're in an insulin-resistant state, it just does not work. You're in a sugar-burning state in that so-called glycolytic metabolism. And if you want to learn more about that, check out Chapter 2 and 3 of Belly Fat Effect because it's really something that I think a lot of people don't understand. You know, they're going to the gym and they're doing everything right, but they're not changing their diet, so they're still insulin-resistant and they just can't burn fat. Berberine does so much. This is a clinical study that looked at reproductive features of berberine, and specifically they looked at how berberine improves uh, parameters in women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. So this is the so-called PCOS is actually quite prevalent. I believe, I don't know, I think it's 15 to 20% of women have this condition. So it's fairly high in the population and increasing. And we're seeing more and more younger women with PCOS. And it's just a consequence of insulin resistance. So if we can improve that through a herb that has very little uh, you know, consequences and side effects, I think that's a great uh, approach. Now, I want to read to you a uh, just a snippet from a meta-analysis that looked at 13 different human clinical trials and the inclusion criteria for this meta-analysis. And just in case you don't know, a meta-analysis is a study of studies and they have different inclusion criteria where they select studies and if they have this you know, objective, then they'll include it. And if they don't, they'll reject it. And 
the inclusion criteria here was a randomized placebo controlled trial. And so they found, I think, like I said, 13 different studies, nine of which met this inclusion criteria, and they did statistical analysis and found, I'm going to read a quote to you, based on the existing evidence reviewed, berberine has beneficial effects on blood glucose control in the treatment of type 2 diabetic patients and exhibits efficacy comparable with that of conventional oral hypoglycemics. Said another way, berberine rocks, and its efficacy is on par with what is commonly used to change blood glucose in a medical setting. Okay, so I want to finish off the study and talk about uh, a recent study by Lipping Zhao. And if you don't know this, who this person is, I would check him out if you're really into all this research. So this is a researcher from China who himself had weight-related uh, challenges. He had a lot of belly fat. He was overweight. And he figured out that, you know, the calorie in calorie out thing, it just doesn't work. It didn't work out for him. It didn't make sense from a mathematical standpoint because the body likes to what they call homeostatically control its weight and metabolism. And so when you lose a lot of weight, the body's going to guard that and, and metabolic parameters are going to slow down. We showed that with that New England Journal of Medicine study at the start of this. But anyway, Lipping Zhao is a huge gut researcher. And he conducted a clinical study where he combined pretty much everything that we're talking about. Obviously, I don't know him. He doesn't know me. But what he did was found individuals that uh, enrolled these individuals that had metabolic syndrome and belly fat into a study and had them eat a diet rich in fiber, plant-based polyphenols, and add in phytochemicals, including berberine. And you know, some of the herbs are a little bit different. These were traditional Chinese herb. Berberine has been used for hundreds, if not thousands of years in Chinese medicine in China. So he had these individuals make some dietary changes, add in more fiber, add these phytochemicals, and then track them for eight weeks and looked at their gut parameters, looked at metabolic parameters, blood pressure, everything else. And, and there was a lot of beneficial changes. And I, I want to highlight this because we're not going to get randomized placebo controlled trials and every single little thing that we do, you know, from changing our diet to adding in these phytochemicals. But this was one of them that I think is very close. So if we want to be very factual, very evidence-based when making these recommendations on what people should be doing and how should they change their lives and how can they accelerate these beneficial metabolic changes, and how can they burn fat better? I think this is the closest it's going to get. And so what he found, then they concluded at the end of the study, I'm going to read it to you, reduced endotoxin producing bacteria and increased gut barrier protecting bacteria in the gut, improved gut barrier function, reduced serum endotoxin load, and alleviated low-grade inflammation can explain why our dietary intervention improved insulin sensitivity and metabolic parameters of the cohort tested. That's a lot to digest right there, but let me just break it down to you. So endotoxin is that bacterial appendage that's really problematic. It's very pro-inflammatory. So we have about five grams of this endotoxin containing bacteria in our GI tract. E. coli would be the, the you know kind of prototypical endotoxin containing bacteria. And any small changes or perturbations in the integrity of the GI tract causes increased uh, you know, absorption, translocation, if you will, of this endotoxin substance, and it is a very pro-inflammatory guy. It's going to latch on to these toll-like receptors found on, on a lot of different tissues in the body and really fire the alarm bells of the immune system, which if you, again, listen to Sean Croxton's podcast on iTunes, yeah, Underground Wellness, but you know we talk about how inflammation is linked with insulin resistance, and that, that's so critical. So we can work on the gut all day long you know, these gut hormones. But if you have gut integrity issues and you have leaky gut and you have these bacterial endotoxin particles crossing the GI tract, then you're going to have inflammation in the systemic system, which is going to halt fat burning. And again, listen to that podcast to learn more, preferably from plants, not so much grains from vegetables and fruits and so forth. And also add in pea protein, I think that's great. And the phytochemicals. So the different color-rich herbs and botanicals, I think curcumin, resveratrol, and berberine are ones that I'm going to include pretty much every day unless you know I learn otherwise uh, due to all their beneficial effects. This was a rapid-fire webinar. You know, there's so much that we dove into. If you like this information, you want to learn more, and you haven't purchased the belly fat effect. Again, the subtitle is The Real Secret About How Your Diet, Intestinal Health, and Gut Bacteria Help You Burn Fat. Check that out on Amazon. It's on the Kindle. It's on the Nook. Um, 
and it has some bonuses for you. So what's in there is, you know, 1500 references, all, you know, peer reviewed academic, uh, it's written for the layman, you know, but doctors of all types have reported that, uh, it met their 10 chapters, you know, close to 400 pages, a bunch of tables and illustrations. Now, if you do get the book, send your receipt over to info at mikemutzel.com and we will give you access to the bonus replays. And so some of you have, um, have already opted in for that. And we have a membership site and my leptin blueprint video where I talk about all the immunological roles of leptin and how leptin is very pro-inflammatory indirectly and how that is really the problem linked with leptin. That is available at your disposal. Now let's open it up for some live questions. Bettina, are you ready? I'm sorry, I was muted. We... Oh, no, you're good. <laughs> we have a question about where the berberine is sourced and I honestly do not know that. Do you know, Mike? No, I believe it's the bayberry leaves. And Berberiza, I believe it is. Um, oh, okay. I, was, I wasn't thinking in terms of source like that. I can let you know um, shortly <laughs> on that one, surely. Normally, they're, like you said, Bettina, they're listed you know, under parentheses, the exact origin of that. So I'm not sure, but yeah, on the... It's on the back of the label. It's on the supplement back of the label, and it's um, right in parentheses there. Oh, okay. That's uh, great. It's also, uh, another question is, does stimulating GLP-1 slow gastric emptying? I could be wrong on this. Uh, I believe PYY slows it down and GLP-1 increases GI emptying. Um, so again, I, I, I'd have to, you know, send a, that's a really good question, by the way. Um, so Kathy, I'll, I'll, I'll do some digging around, but I believe PYY slows GI emptying and GLP-1 increases it. And the, the nice thing is these L cells release both those different compounds. So if we're, you know, optimizing the gut hormones through berberine or fiber or healthy bifidobacteria, we're not increasing GLP-1 more than we're affecting PYY. So you're going to get a nice balance there. And I don't think we're going to have any motility issues. And again, everyone's unique and there could be caveats to the rule and so on. But that's why I think going after this approach using natural means is much better than using like DPP-4 inhibitors and just affecting GLP-1 or just affecting there's GLP-1 or there's you know, CCK, you know, I think the nice thing about these herbs and botanicals is we they've been found present in our diet for as long as we've been around and we, we've just avoided, you know, moved away from, from them in the refinement and commercialization of food. So I'm of the belief that it's more of like a adaptogenic effect and will not dramatically increase one gut hormone over the other, uh, like a pharmaceutical would. And, and so I think the long-term consequences in terms of side effects are not going to be there. But that's a great question. We have another question about endotoxins. Would supplementing with activated charcoal help absorb endotoxins so that they're not absorbed into the body while working with a client to heal the gut? Really good question, you know. And I don't know the science on charcoal and endotoxins. So I'm of the understanding, and again, I could be wrong here, that charcoal is really more of a heavy metal chelator, so to speak. And endotoxin, although they have the word toxin in them, it's really a, a bacterial fat slash protein molecule that's found on the exterior surface of bacteria. It's not a traditional toxin, so to speak. So I don't know if charcoal will actually like block endotoxin. Uh, but again, I, I could be wrong on that. There could be some research on that. What I do know about blocking endotoxins, though, are or what your treatment options are, is increasing phytochemicals and, and reducing the consumption of bad meat. So endotoxin is found in all, we, we all have endotoxin, about five grams in our GI tract, but it's, it's found in animal products primarily. And when we eat bad meat, it's not, this endotoxin is not killed by heat. So we do absorb it. If we have gut permeability, we're going to have challenges, uh, reducing gut permeability, improving gut stability, uh, improving the polyphenolic compounds in the diet and also increasing fiber. So fiber with bad meat or like fiber or prebiotics with bad meat or polyphenols with bad meat will offset that endotoxin absorption. And that's the other thing too, is individuals in embark on the ketogenic diet. I know fat is really in right now and you know, there's a big push, but even in studies, they've used olive oil. Researchers have used olive oil to cause metabolic endotoxemia. So I think it's very important for individuals, if you are going to have a high fat diet, to take polyphenols as well, to take resveratrol or even 
you know, have some pomegranate, a little bit of pomegranate juice or red wine or green tea or, you know, mince up some garlic or onions because that will help you offset the endotoxin that you would absorb. Okay. There's another question on the dosage um, for obese children as far as safety and efficacy of the berberine. Yeah, the, good question. You know, I don't know if there's data on children, but I, that doesn't mean it's not effective. I think that would just, I would maybe cut it in half to be safe. You know, a 1,500 milligrams per day is what's used in overweight um, adults, you know, and, and metabolic syndrome adults and diabetic adults, I would say maybe cut it in half or, or just do 500 milligrams and see how it is. Again, studies have shown that overweight insulin resistant children also have imbalances in their gut hormones and imbalances in their gut microbiome. So adding a nutrient like berberine in that's going to improve all those parameters is going to be beneficial. But certainly practitioners can take it upon themselves to, as you say, Start low and go slow yeah. uh, with experimental. Um, let's see. Doctor wants to know if you have any more any suggestions for how to find out some more about um, bacteriotes. Do you know of any research or any books that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't want to be self-promoting, but the book <laughs> Belly Fat Effect has have you know 1,800 references in there and dive into all the studies you know between firmicutes and bacteriotes because the data is actually not that clear cut. There is some gray area. In terms of like, well, our our firmicutes is really bad, and our bacteroidea is really good, and 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 so forth. So I tried to review that the best I can, and new research shows that that bacteroidea are probably more healthy than the firmicutes. And firmicutes, although not every study shows a link with obesity and metabolic syndrome, most new recent studies have shown that using. Uh, 16 uh, double-stranded DNA and st so forth to measure the level of dysbiosis. So yeah, that's a, that's a good question. There's still, the jury's still out kind of, but new research is linking, uh, finding that correlation more strong. Mm -hmm. uh, another question, let's see here. Would you recommend prebiotics in addition to probiotics for anyone on a lengthy antibiotic therapy, for instance, treating Lyme or co-infection? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, and I think I'd say absolute yes. So again, we've talked about prebiotics tonight more in the context of how they beneficially affect the gut hormones and the, those specifically those L cells, the cells that release all these healthy hormones in the GI tract. But prebiotic fiber is really fuel for healthy gut bacteria. And so, so if individuals are taking antibiotics, I think it would be very beneficial to not only take probiotics and also take Saccharomyces boulardii, that's a probiotic yeast, along with prebiotic fiber, because that's going to basically give a three-pronged approach to um, help to avoid any permanent dysbiosis that would be a result of taking that antibiotic. How does the paleo diet assist metabolism if it's not including healthy phytochemicals in foods? Yeah, that's a really good point. Well, if you think about, okay, well, what is the paleo diet? Vegetables, fruits, lean protein, nuts and seeds. Well, in that order, I mean, if you hear Lauren Cordain, you know, is he a meat guy? Yeah, he's a meat guy. But it's a lot of herbivorous, you know, vegetable consumption, berry consumption, and those compounds do have a lot of polyphenols. So I think the modern paleo diet has more or less morphed into quasi Atkins diet, where it's just you know, high protein, high fat. And I think a lot of people that are they're really die hard are eating the real food, you know, growing their own fruits and vegetables, shopping at farmers markets and, and having a lot of color in the diet. But that's a really good point that whoever asked that question brings up because I think that's one of the flaws in the general understanding of the paleo diet is you can actually cause, you know, more harm than good if you uh, look, lard is good, butter is good. I mean, that's all fine. But I will tell you, human clinical studies, they use lard and butter and even olive oil to induce metabolic endotoxemia. And what I mean by that is to cause, basically induce le a low-grade leaky gut and to translocate these bacterial fragments called endotoxin into the systemic periphery, which then cause a whole slew of metabolic problems. So I'd say eat paleo, eat high fat, eat butter, eat lard, do all that. But you definitely want to make sure that you're dicing up onions and garlic and rosemary and drinking green tea and, and putting in minced curcumin and turmeric into your foods because you're going to offset some of the potential damage that might occur. And not that fats are bad, but if you eat a lot of fat, it can cause these chylomicrons form in the small intestine. They absorb endotoxin has figured out a way, this bacterial endotoxin has figured out a way to 
kind of hijack into this these chylomicrons and, and get into the systemic periphery where they cause all these inflammatory pathways to be activated. Do you want to comment on what happens when the small intestine is coated with a, um, a biofilm, how the communication is affected? You're talking about the receptors and um, the hormones. Honestly, there's not a whole lot of research on biofilms and like metabolic health. And uh, I admit that that's just kind of my interest area. Is is there a biofilm issue? Probably, but I haven't really looked at that quite extensively. So I would say, you know, these studies didn't control for a biofilm. And so they're randomly selecting individuals and using healthy controls and, and so on. So I would say, do you need to give like proteolytic enzymes beforehand and if, or, you know, EDTA or whatever? Probably not. We all have biofilms. We have biofilms in our mouth you know, and mucosal tissues and so on. That, that, that this is a huge part of it. But I just look at the research and the data and that wasn't a factor that was controlled for, yet they showed metabolic improvements and changes in these hormones. So, you know, if you know a patient that or you you yourself have biofilm related issues and you've done some sort of testing, which I don't know what test, I would love to know how you test for that. But um, I would say, sure, you know, address the biofilm first. Um, however, I think based upon the research, that wasn't a variable that was controlled for, yet these therapies have been shown to be effective. Uh, the general question, does stress or cortisol, higher cortisol cause leaky gut? Yeah, so I mean, there's many different ways. Cortisol has been shown, and this is the work of Datis Grazian. I haven't seen this in any research articles, but it's shown to affect the regeneration of enterocytes and the mucosal tissue. But if we think about cortisol being activated, that's that's a byproduct of the systemic, the autonomic nervous system from being activated. So if we're in a sympathetic state, you know, the GI, the vagal nerve's not being activated. That means that the motility, you know, all the gut hormones, digestive products are not going to be stimulated. So I think, you know, in, indirectly, I'm sure there are more direct ways by which cortisol affects gut permeability that I don't exactly know about, or maybe that's not understood. But again, if cortisol is turned up, then, and if, you know, you can't be in a sympathetic and a parasympathetic state at the same time. It, you know, they're kind of mutually exclusive. You're either in rest and digest or you're fight or flight. It's one or the other. And so I think, you know, the, the take-home message here is clinically, you know, if people are stuck in this parasympathetic state, you need to help guide them and, and do heart math and breathing and mindful-based meditation and uh, yoga and tai chi and, and so on to help to tone down that sympathetic response and, and pivot them back into more vagal nerve activation. Okay. Mike, do you want to comment on um, Dr. Fine is saying berberine is an incretin and supposedly can increase the risk of pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer from what he's read, even though it's excellent in decreasing glucose? Yeah, uh, Dr. Fine, I would love to, I mean, we can unmute you and talk about that if you'd like. So type in there if you want to get live and chat about that. And that's a great point. So as I did mention, some of these incretin compounds, Bayetta and Genuvia, that is a concern because they are kind of whipping the horse, so to speak, and 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 causing challenges with the pancreas. But the, the thing about berberine is, yeah, it, it's an incretin you know, in Cretan hormone mimetic, so to speak, and it's it's driving GLP one and driving CCK in these compound and bulk compounds, but it's not it's not a pharmaceutical compound in the sense that it's so selective for driving GLP one. It's just one of these off target things. Remember, berberine also does a million and one other different things, just like curcumin and resveratrol. And it just so happens to be that this is one of them. So that's the difference between a, a drug is really very selective in its target. You know, whether that's inhibiting an enzyme, activating a receptor site, breaking down a substance, whereas berberine is just really a polyphenol. Does it fit like a lock and key in different receptors? Probably, but it's also doing all these different things. And so I think the long-term effects, is it something that we want to be on forever? Probably not, but I think it's probably safer and has less potential long-term side effects than some of these other pharmaceutical compounds that are designed specifically to only affect one receptor site or one enzyme system. Um, let's see, oligosaccharides versus fermented foods. Yeah, so I think both. That's one thing I didn't dive into. Um, I love fermented foods, and for some reason I always forget to talk about it, even though my wife and I ferment a bunch of foods. You know, there's just not a lot of, you know, try to review research, and unfortunately not a lot of research on fermented foods because it's hard to standardize, you know, but very healthy, every, you know, culture throughout the world, you know, besides in the U.S. has some sort of fermented foods 
uh, before and after meals. You know, I was in Korea last November, about a, close to a year ago now, and bef- you know, even for breakfast, it was kimchi before and after, and and you know. Um, it was funny. I've you know I've shared this story with you before, but the only overweight individuals were the Americans that were there, and the and the children. And well, not the only, but by and large. And I was asking some local Korean doctors that I was with, and they said, "Yeah, they're you know they think kimchi had a huge role there. You know, the influx of obviously bad foods, but kimchi used to be this thing where and the mother of the house or the grandmother of the house would go and and collect cabbage, and it was like a you know a all weekend thing. And now it's just oh, you go to the supermarket and pick up commercially prepared kimchi. It doesn't have the same prebiotic or probiotic fi- you know compounds in there, and and so I think." If you can get a really healthy, either make it yourself or buy it from a reputable supplier at Whole Foods or Natural Foods or what have you, then it absolutely include the the fermented foods. Along the lines of fermented foods, I'm really not familiar with fermented fish oil. Someone is asking for your opinion on that. Yeah, that, I know that's big in the CrossFit community, fermented cod liver oil. And, uh, you know, I um, it's funny, I was thinking about that last night when my wife made fermented lemons, which sound kind of crazy. Like why would you even, they taste amazing. And it took her three weeks to, to get through them and they tasted really good. And I was thinking, okay, well, how would this help with fish oil? You know, I was like, why, what would that change in the structure? And I actually have no idea why that would be beneficial. I know this is big in the paleo CrossFit community and uh, you know, maybe someone can enlighten me or I'll do some research. I haven't seen any research on that. Um, to me, I think it would probably be not a good thing because actually, you know, fish oils are a long chain polyunsaturated PUFAs. That's what they're called, polyunsaturated fatty acids, and they're highly susceptible to oxidative damage. And so, you know, I don't know what kind of microbial interactions would occur with the fish oil. Is that good or bad? It could be very good, but it also could be very, very bad, you know, and that's why we don't cook with fish oil. If we heat these polyunsaturated oils, we create damaging compounds, you know, whether it's trans fatty acids or just a lot of nasty advanced glycation end products and so on. So I really, I don't know if that's really a good idea. I'm not saying it's a bad idea, but I would love to see some data there and some testing on the oxidation and uh, peroxides that are made and so forth. But Tina, do you have any feedback there? That's exactly what I was thinking. I'd love to see the assays before, you know, making any comment on a particular oil, whatever company is making them. But Tina, thank you so much for staying on and fielding all those great questions. And and again, sorry guys about my keynote system. I have no idea why it kept failing on you, but hopefully you benefited from this webinar. Thank you, everyone. All right, Bettina, have a good night. Okay, good night.